I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they can be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. I can't believe we got 20. I'd like to point out that there's plenty of other uh, cryptid podcasts that I listen to, which very quickly, like, they started episodes like one through five cryptids and then they did like hard left because there was cl- like it's hard man i'm imp- yeah oh. like, i'm thoroughly impressed and i like that we, like i'm heavily biased <laughs> but i like our research and our breakdowns quite a bit <laughs> yeah i do too yeah. um like I, let, let me be totally candid though there is gonna po- be a point where i talk about aliens oh yeah no that's like like uh-huh. we're gonna hit a point where John becomes the alien guy. It, it's already started. There's gonna be aliens. There's gonna be ghosts. There's gonna be Oni at some point in time because it's really just cool things that we think is cool but can't talk about with coworkers. <laughs> you know, which means I probably should start doing that Transformers podcast soon. There's nobody can see you other than me, but for the listeners, John is looking around the room he's in, uh, swiveling in his, uh, what is that, a leather swivel chair, and he's mm-hmm. got, do you have a rough estimate for just that room, no no, ex, no rooms outside of that? What, I can tell you for the numbers that how many. line the walls, yeah? I can actually tell you specifically how many, give me a second. Okay. Um, uh, let me, let me pull up my spreadsheet. <laughs> Which I actually had to update it because I got a few. Uh, so I got recently got bot bots. Mm-hmm. I recently got some siege mini cons. Yeah. Um, I finished Abominus. So I've got a few things I had to add to it. But let me. Okay. Let me uh, let me open up my collection directory, which has got multiple collections in it. Okay. And uh, collection inventory. So let me tell you how many are in this room right now. On display, there's currently 141, adding about, mm, let's say, 20 for variance because I take stuff out sometimes and don't update yeah. this. Um, that's a display rate of about 25% um, <laughs> because I do keep those ratios because I am – I might be slightly psychopathic. I don't know. <laughs> slightly? Uh, that's an understatement. But – Hey, listen, I got my Power Rangers on display. I got Abominus over here. I got the Akiba Rangers up here. One of the Akiba Blues doing a weird thing. Then I got like one Hess truck that I kept. <laughs> Transmutate. I got, I got Shroom Godzilla's. Transmutate, I have to say, is the most disturbing look like out of everything. I always thought he was disturbing. She. She, sorry. It's a she. <laughs> he's holding it up to the camera and uh really just giving me nightmares for the rest of the day <laughs> well you do know that that episode was about euthanasia right no uh, i was probably not making that connection at the time but now i do. yeah it's it's an episode of transformers about euthanasia um well medically assisted suicide basically yeah um you know I like the know joke that... from futurama <laughs> yeah yeah so <laughs> For those of you who don't know, um, in Beast Wars, there's this notion of protoforms. Mm -hmm. In Transformers in general, there's the notion of protoforms. And um, what happened was uh, the Maximals were piloting a research class ship known as the Axelon. Uh Um, And as they're traveling... Here I cut out several minutes of John's explanation. I will insert an abridged version at the end of our episode. For those of you who are interested, and if you are not, please feel free to skip to the end of the episode and reevaluate your life choices. But there's a lot to it. It's a very complicated episode. It makes me feel things. (laughs) 
Um, <laughs> but then again, every episode of Beast Wars makes you feel things. So, you know. Yeah. So I just talked for, I filled air for six minutes on just explaining the plot of Beast Wars. So hey, there's that. Hey. Yeah, but thankfully, um, <clears throat> corporate did say they want us to become more and more specific and reduce the number of listeners to the point where it's exclusively three people, including us, that get the jokes. So I should start talking about Telos then. Oh, yeah. Telos Principle or Telos? No, Telos, the the book. The comic. Uh, oh, yeah. I love Telos. Yeah. If you don't know what Telos is, search it. Uh-huh. It's T-E-L-L-O-S. It's a phenomenal book, uh, comic book. I recommend it to everyone. I have every issue. I have them all in trade. I have a signed copy by the author. I love I love Telos. Oh, yeah. He's uh, also from the Hudson Valley, so. Yeah. Uh, after that, I will say, is that the same? No, it can't be. The Mask of the Red Death comic that we no, read in no. school. Different guy. Okay. Um, I'm going to withhold all of my information about bandsaw blades that I was going to uh, uh, talk about. Oh, he's holding up. It's okay. It's it, not blown out now. I oh, look at that. Yeah, it's it's a it's. I got it signed when I was like a kid. Right on. Um, it says to John. Very nice meeting you. <laughs> so I have yeah. uh, in my office. I have all the things that I've ever gotten signed. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a script signed by Simon Furman. I've got a script. Si- I've got the. Uh, Telos issue three signed by the author. Um, I got a Weird Al signature somewhere in here, and I have um, downstairs. I have a CD signed by Stan Bush. Gotcha. And the main reason I have that CD signed by Stan Bush is because I saw Stan Bush and he looked sad. Uh huh. Because no one was visiting him at at Botcon. Uh, for those of you who are unsure of who Simon Furman is, that John just sort of like casually mentioned by name. Without listing what he's known for, uh, Transformers. He's cool. Yeah. It was. It, it's a signed script for Beast Wars One Dreamwave, which never happened. Yeah. Um. It read really cool. The dude was awesome. He's mm-hmm. British. Hmm. So he's cool. <laughs> like, I mean, the, it, it's the Gavin effect, right? Yeah. Uh, people love Gavin of uh, Rooster Teeth fame mm-hmm. because. He's British, and people will violently defend Gavin. Oh, <laughs> like violently. People like grapes. All I'm people saying. People like grapes. People All like I'm grapes. saying. So, I think I think ten minutes is more than enough of me vamping about random stuff that's in my room. Unless you want me to talk about more. I mean, I got Godzilla VHS. Whoa! No! No! Okay, Godzilla <laughs> is for another episode. Godzilla is another episode. <laughs> well, Godzilla is definitely an episode of this podcast. All on its own. I, I'm going to do an episode about Godzilla. Like, <laughs> that's already a foregone conclusion. Uh-huh. I know it's not. he's not a cryptid and no one believes he's real. Mm-hmm. Except in my heart, I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, that's all I got. Yeah. That was the bit. <laughs> but Godzilla 3 was bad. There's I. So you said... It uh, hurt my soul. This is Godzilla three of the animated Godzilla uh, uh, movies, not necessarily the, the third ones. Godzilla. F- yeah, exactly. Uh, third Godzilla movie was Godzilla versus King Kong, and that was phenomenal. Yeah. So. Yeah, that, that's why I was clarifying, right? Because because yeah. people would be like, "Holy!" They'd be like, "What are you talking about?" I mean, I've got a copy of God- King Kong versus Godzilla right here, so you know. Yeah. Like, I've got. <laughs> I have like three copies of this movie. Yeah. It's a good movie. Yeah, a lot of the Godzillas are are just good movies or not necessarily good, but they're good because they're not necessarily good movies. Except for Godzilla Raids again. No, no, no. Uh, not, no. Don't say Destroy All Monsters. No, it's not Destroy All Monsters, but it was the other one. You can uh, say it's uh, the one with Biollante because every time someone says Biollante, they say it different. Biollante, Biollante, Biollante. It's the whole movie. There's zero so, consistency. There's zero right. consistency. As much as I want to talk about Godzilla, we have to get back that to That took Skinwalker. me so far out of the movie. We have to get back to what? 
skimwalkers because oh we're, shit okay we're, we're literally 11 minutes and 30 into, <laughs> i didn't into even recording. realize we're doing skinwalkers part two all right hang oh, on i Let thought we were gonna do that do we want to do skinwalkers part two or do we want to do my stuff we can do whatever i've got both of all them right. prepared so we could do part two or we could do your stuff either I'll, way I'll is do, fine i can do my stuff okay let's let's cut this realization that we made a mistake out <laughs> brandon here nope I don't think it's a mistake. I think it's it's reality podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess we're just being true. So, <laughs> I forgot to make an episode joke this time. Um, so, we're going to call this... Um, yeah, that's call... why I didn't jump in with, like, welcome to... It, you know. <laughs> oh, boy. Wow. Man, I got so excited talking about Godzilla. Uh, I could tell. Transformers. Actually... You know what? You might need um, to tuck that under your belt. We're gonna call this. We're gonna call this Cryptid Wars. Cryptid. Okay. Um, it's it's a podcast where John talks about a different cryptid every week, but he frames it in the context of how Beast Wars can teach us more about that cryptid. Uh huh. Um. So you know, like for example, we can learn a little bit more about the Kraken through uh, Clawjaw's arc um, uh -huh. in the comics. Yeah. So uh, Clawjaw, of course, is the squid-based transformer. He was recolored into Ecard um, with Taco Tank. <laughs> he got everything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Where's our money, Hasbro? I wish. <laughs> um, so, anywho, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And in actuality, <laughs> we're Cryptopedia. Um, oh. This episode's a little different. Yeah. Uh, so the different part about this episode, yeah, is it was originally going to be more like the, the Skimwalker episode where we cover Skimwalkers in general. Yeah. Um, but and here's the big but. Yeah. It ended up being. Um, it ended up being there was so much content about the one thing. <gasps> yeah. That, that I literally just made it about that one thing, and I'm going to cover the more general case in a future episode. Oh, yeah! Wait, wait, wait. Do another two-parter! Uh, eventually. I don't know if I'm going to immediately do the second part yeah. immediately after, because... That's pretty dope. Well, there's some stuff about it, but yeah. we're, we're going to go into that. Um, So, this particular creature, uh, it only had one sighting, well, of this iteration. Okay. I like this. I like it when there's, like, more. Like, there's always more, but there's not always more. It depends how you say it. But I know what you're talking about. Like, yeah, yeah. this version, there's only the, the, the this one sighting. This is a very discreet creature. Okay. Um, I got you. It Where's was... its hoodie up? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it, it goes to the bank. Um, it gets yelled at by the tellers a lot, though. Why would it get yelled at by the tellers? Because it's got its hoodie up. Oh, yeah. yeah. Don't. Uh, that's bad. Just don't. It's bad the, manners. In a, in you a gotta, bank. Yeah. You got you to gotta put your hoodie. You got to take your hoodie down. Take those sunglasses off, Unabomber. Yeah. Just, just stop doing that, Ted. Yeah. They, and uh, banks, you got to get your stickers right. Every bank I walk into, I don't walk into a lot of different banks, but every time I go into one, I'm a different height. And you all got to get that down. That's important. That's true. That is important. Also, 7-Eleven's got to get that down. Actually, I think 7-Eleven's might have it down better than banks. Probably. Like, Probably. not even joking. I've yeah. been in more gas stations that have that down. Anywho, so the first sighting was in <laughs> April 1980. <laughs> or, wow, not 1980. 1890. 1890. Okay. Um, its region was Tombstone, Arizona. And if I tell you it's taxonomy, I'll give it away. Okay. So I'm becoming what is suspicious. Your, what is your guess first? Uh, 1890. I uh, so, Tombstone, so, Arizona. So this is, um, this is, I'm thinking. So this is like teapot dome. Thirty. Scale, this is thirty around. years after Skinwalkers Part One. Yep. Tune in next week for Part Two. Um. So that's my base point because I'm not super familiar with that point in time. Um, oh, Teapot Dome was way later. Okay. Oh, was it? Yeah. That was. I literally have no no context. <laughs> like I'm thinking, and outside of 1860, that's a close. 
literally skinwalkers is my closest reference so here's the thing for me like after yeah. after after the civil war yeah right i always imagine everything is like a whole sort of general mishmash yeah until the 20s like not even joking yeah. like that's my well actually no uh 1912 i imagine world war one mm-hmm. 1920s world war ii then history starts to get increasingly more discreet yeah um and actually weirdly before the civil war it's weirdly discreet too uh-huh but that period between the civil war and world war one is like my mystery zone oh, oh yeah totally so yeah. i'm gonna i do have a guess that i'm gonna make okay but it's based off of the music video that you posted to the facebook group the cryptopedia facebook group yep yep and knowing where my brain goes and knowing it's you having mm-hmm. posted the song Wild Wild West Wiki Wiki by by Will Smith James West Desperado uh that's and, all I can remember Wiki Wiki Wild Wild Okay so let me one that's a sin what you just did and two I believe you meant Wiki Wild Wiki Wiki Wild 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 West Jim James West, West Desperado Rough Rider mm-hmm. No you ain't <laughs> No you don't want a nada Actually I'm going to stop the stroke here because yeah. it's real bad Jackalope that's yeah. where I'm going We see you posted Wild Wild West I don't know anything about the time period But you posted Wild Wild West And I was like okay Wild West what's it gotta be We got spittoons we got whiskey We got jackalope so boom so, Jackalope I'll, I'll give you the taxonomy now Because you made your first guess Yes, It's a bird Oh shit Okay. So now now does I'm that ha- change your answer? Hang on. Hang on. You just shook my you, you shook my world, man. I did. Uh, I knew it was the the jackalope. <laughs> That's where it was. I knew it was the jackalope. We're in the 8 okay, so we're 30 years after the Skinwalker era that the traditional Skinwalker era that I did in the in mm-hmm. the first episode. You're talking a bird. You're talking Arizona, which is southwest. So I'm going to say Firebird. And if that's not it, that's my only... I I think you're thinking of the right creep it, cre- creature. Phoenix? Um, Wait, huh? Phoenix, Arizona? Is it a Phoenix? No. Is it a Phoenix? It's, it's Tombstone, Arizona. Oh, God. It, okay, I'm done. It's a Thunderbird. A, it's a Thunderbird. So, although this is a very particular I- iteration of the Thunderbird, Oh, Tombstone Thunderbird, or Arizona Thunderbird, as some people have called it. it was a and yes, joke. that was a that was a good Thundercats. Joke. Okay, I good. approve of that. I approve <laughs> of the. I, that's I'm. Don't worry. I was going to stop and just just take a moment and just really, really focus in on the fact that you made a good, good Thundercats joke. You need to be respected for that Thundercats joke. It's a good one. It was so good, and I know you knew it because you have sight beyond sight. I do. Yeah. I also have a Mumra figure in a bin in the basement that I was planning on. <laughs> so, um, I might be selling that soon, actually. Ooh, all right. Just because I, I don't need it. I yeah. literally don't need it. I don't have a display for it. And it's from the remake, and its articulation's kind of meh, and I just yeah. I don't really need it. It doesn't, it's that whole, you know, bring you joy thing. It doesn't really bring me joy anymore. No? Meh. Mumra's Not really. Shit. Do you have an original uh, series of Mumra? No, it's it's from the uh, it's from the the remake. Remember when we got the cartoon when you got your remake. yeah when you got yeah. your six inch yeah I think I got I think I got mine or your six inch uh, Lionel I got mine around the same time you got that okay so um, I dig it you know the, it's not bad I, I really don't I'm not opposed to the remake oh the remake was phenomenal yeah. it was very well animated um I loved Chitara's design I liked um Lionel's design. The Wiley Kit and Wiley Cat, I always hate. They're kind of, yeah, um, they've always been meh, you know? I'm glad they took Snarf's voice away. I am not. That was my biggest problem with Snarf. Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my biggest problem with the whole thing was what they did with Snarf. <laughs> uh, I guess we differ then, because yeah. Snarf, Snarf was rough. Uh-huh. I, I loved 
Now this is becoming a Thundercat podcast. <laughs> it's, it's, it's 20 you know minutes of we just talk about Transformers and Thundercats. <laughs> I guess we're owned by Hasbro. Yeah. Which is fine by me. I, I mean, mean, I like Hasbro. I usually hate marketing departments, but if you're Hasbro, right on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, wait. So now here's the thing. I yes. don't think Thundercats was Hasbro. Who was it? Uh, I want to say it was Mattel. Was it? Mm-mm-mm-mm. All right. So it's owned by Warner Brothers. Okay, but it it looks like it is Mattel. Yeah, because, well, I, I just realized that because I was looking at Big Bad Toy Store again um, because I'm a monster. Yeah. And uh, um, there's a, a Mattel, like, selects oh, thing. Oh, so... did you see the Mezco Toys 14-inch Thundercats Mumra action figure? I did not. Not yet. It's... Oh, it's a hun- what? It's one hundred and fifty dollars, but it's glorious. It's M E Z C O toys, and it's uh, the Brandon. 14th- yeah, Brandon. Okay, I get it. I was being yeah. specific. I I know I know what Mezco is. You you don't have to. Sp- Thank you. Thank you for the specificity. Yeah, the articulation is terrible, but th- it's just glorious looking. It's oh literally God. only shoulder, like it's fixed joint with the exception of shoulders and maybe legs. I can't tell from the picture, but it's so good looking. Well, it was originally forty, was it? But, but it's gone up aftermarket. Oh man! Oh, this lino is very cool. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> I have to issue a formal apology to our our <laughs> listeners because. It's this is the latest we've ever recorded an episode. Uh-huh. It's seven thirty three p.m. I had to drive. There's a snowstorm out there. It's actually snowing a lot now. Is it? Oh man, it was a long day. So, anywho, this is like um, eight hours after we normally record. <laughs> yes, it actually is. <laughs> so, uh, I was planning on doing the Thunderbird for a while, and this one in particular because. Um, I read a weird U.S. article about it years and years ago. Okay. Um, but recently, uh, our Patreon subscriber, Clay Sinclair, oh. did put in a request for the Thunder. Woo! All right, cool. So, right on. Um, so this is this is a listener request. Episode, yeah. And if you request an episode, um, we'll be more than happy to call you out uh-huh. live that you're a nerd who loves cryptids. Yeah. But don't worry, it's okay, because we're nerds who love cryptids. Yeah. So <laughs> If that's not obvious at this point in time. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, this is a very particular episode uh-huh. on the Tombstone Thunderbird. Okay, the not Ari- the Ford Thunderbird originally no. uh released to the public in 1955 there's your fun car fact for cool guys did car you fact. actually know that off the top of your head no that was a, that was i had to look it up okay um <laughs> <laughs> um so a few things about this though okay uh this episode we will not be going into the native american version of thunderbird oh nice deliberately. okay um, because there's a lot more to that. Yeah. And, uh, I started researching it, but the context of that is so big and there's so yeah. much to it that it's worth doing a whole I want I want to do a whole episode on it and I yeah. don't want to, um, reduce the value of that lore and I don't want to yeah. misrepresent it. So I have to do more research. I have to do more re- readings. Um, I found a lot of cool things. And honestly, it might not just be one episode. It might be several episodes. That's because, pretty awesome. Because the the Northwest Native Americans have one tra- oral tradition. The Northeast have a different one. And the Plains have yet another one. That's so pretty de- cool. Depending on uh, which region of the United States the, the tribe was from, or yeah. Canada for that matter, um, their, their oral tradition will vary mm-hmm. in the types of the nature of their Thunderbird is different. And also, even though um, historically speaking, 
people have made the the connection of modern Thunderbird sightings to the Native American Thunderbird sighting. Uh-huh. I don't know if it's an entirely uh, genuine connection to make. Okay. And I okay. think it's I think it's kind of in the same way that Sasquatch is an appropriation of Native American myths. Yeah. I feel like Thunderbird is appropriation of Native American myths. Gotcha. Um. So, in my context, I consider this a modern or Western Thunderbird. Okay. Not a Native American Thunderbird, because all the all the context makes it seem like it's more like a part of our, um, and by that our I mean American tradition, oral tradition, yeah. of, and talking about Thunderbirds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So cool. Um, this is the first sighting of the modern Thunderbird that I could find. Um, and actually, when I was starting to do research for this episode, I literally went to the Wikipedia article for Thunderbird. Yeah. Looked at the sources and found this article. And then I went on a deep dive on this article, oh. and it ended up being uh, nine pages of content. Holy crap, right on. So, I like it when there's a lot of good stuff. When you can do like a deep dive, and it's not just pointing at random BS or circularly referencing itself, where you're like, oh, and you can really dig in. Well, we're going to get to that. <laughs> oh, so, man. Um, yeah. This was on Saturday, April 26th, 1890. Okay. This article was published in the Tombstone Epitaph. Uh-huh. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I'm going to go over a little bit about Tombstone in a bit, but I think the, the article is more interesting than Tombstone. So, yeah. <clears throat> the article was titled, A Strange Winged Monster Discovered and Killed on the Huachucha Desert. That's Good definitely pronunciation. not how it's pronounced. That's I better don't... than I would have done. You've heard me. You've I... <laughs> That's true. Okay, so <clears throat> let's get to it. Mm-hmm. A winged monster resembling a huge alligator with an extremely elongated tail and an immense pair of wings was found on the desert between Whetstone and Huachucha Mountains last Sunday by two ranchers who were turning home from the Huachuchas. The creature was evidently greatly exhausted by a long flight, and when discovered, was able to fly but a short distance at a time. So uh, we've got basically we've got a reptilian monster flying through the air. So far. yeah, I'm picturing. Um, well, I'm picturing basically what they wrote: an alligator with yeah. a long tail and wings. That'd be pretty um, cool. They didn't specifically say not feathered wings, but I don't think they had to. But that's it, yeah, it's that's well, pretty a pretty neat creature they're describing. Yeah. Um, so after the first shock of wild amazement had passed, the two yeah. men were, who were on horseback and armed with Winchester rifles. We were, should do were, a Winchester episode for one of the, that's like, on my list. whether it's like a real, like a real, real episode or a Patreon, but that'd be a cool one yeah. for someone to do. So I would love, I would love if we ever did like live show stuff. Yeah. I'm going to go out of my way to do a live show near Winchester. And that will be the episode. <laughs> yeah, that'd be pretty Without cool. a doubt. Yeah. Um, which I also made a footnote here. Um, are there Thunderbirds haunting the Winchester Mystery House? Because if no. they kill this bird, wouldn't there be well, one haunting oh, it? Because that's the whole it, thing, right? That's why she built the house, yeah. Yeah, because she was haunted by Thunderbirds. Well, not Thunderbirds. She was haunted by all the people who were killed by Winchester rifles. And if the win- if a Thunderbird was, spoiler alert, was killed by a Winchester rifle, she'd be haunted by that too. That's true. It might it might tweak your brain enough for you to continuously build a weird house for ghosts. I mean, listen, if a giant alligator was following me around 24-7 with wings, I think I might. So- uh, it happened to Donkey Kong. That is true, although he has a jetpack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, they regained sufficient courage to pursue the monster, and after an exciting chase of several miles by horseback, mm-hmm. um, they succeeded in getting near enough to open fire with their rifles and wounding it. The creature then turned on the men, but owing to its exhausted condition, they were able to keep out of its way, and after a few well-directed shots, the monster partially rolled over and remained motionless. The men cautiously approached, their horses snarting with terror, and found that the creature was dead. So, okay, so there's a, a physical specimen mm-hmm. that 
has been seen by the public and examined and is okay. well documented because this is clearly something that's never been seen before or recognized as some extant creature. So it's a big deal, right? It's well documented. Yeah. It's a oh, no, well documented is, big this, deal. This is a huge deal based on this because they have literally the thing that I've been moaning about for yeah. 20 episodes, type specimens. This is a type specimen. Yeah. So, um, but I first want to take a moment to acknowledge that humanity has this endless capacity to destroy things that are different. Yeah. Because literally the first thought that these two ranchers had was, all right, I got a gun. Let me shoot this thing. <laughs> uh-huh. Right? Yeah. Like, that's literally the first thought that popped into mind. Um, also, something very important that I noticed when I was reading through this the first time. Uh-huh. Um, the writer really goes out of his way to mention the fact that this, this creature had a long flight. And oh, there's no way to know. There's yeah. no way to know if it had a long flight. If it's, if it's, there are things I could consider like act like having not seen something before that you could look at it and go, oh, it's freaking tired. But you yeah. have no way of knowing the length of the flight. Yeah, and you know, I I kind of want to take this as a moment to kind of go over the notion of skeptical skeptical thinking. Yeah. Um, because all right, so. Just because a crazy new creature is defined yeah. doesn't mean that I'm instantly not going to believe it, mm-hmm. right? First things first is I, you know, uh, y- you have to verify, right? Yeah. Don't blindly believe that it's true, but then also don't discount it immediately. Uh-huh. Um, but when you're reading a story, uh, absolutisms like this, where it's something along these lines, um, they should be red flags for yeah right oh yeah uh and if you read something like this it begins to smell like embellishment Mm -hmm. so in my experience hoaxes use something that i call vague specifics right Mm -hmm. so this is a vague specific because they're saying that it has a long flight and is exhausted right yeah so it's a that's a very specific thing right and in this context, it now places the the notion that this Thunderbird is a distance flyer. Yeah. Right? And it's exhausted from a long trip, which, since we're humans, mm-hmm. us taking a long trip, we instantly begin to a- associate our own experience with this creature. Right? Mm-hmm. So, now we've anthrop- anthropomorphized this giant alligator, winged alligator. Yeah. So... <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, now... We're placing our pre-existing conditions, our pre-existing knowledge onto this creature. Yeah. And if you're writing a hoax or if you're embellishing a story and you want people to believe what you're saying, the yeah. first thing that you do, and I don't know if this author did it consciously, subconsciously, anything like that. One of the first things you do is you tell people, hey, here's something you can hang on to. Yeah. Here's a kernel, here's a kernel of something that you can see and mm-hmm. you can understand. Yeah. Right? So the problem is in the context of this story, since he's created this notion of a long distance flyer, mm-hmm. long distance flyers don't get exhausted from flying. <laughs> that's, that's kind of their thing, right? Yeah. So um, if you take close consideration and you start to look into like what modern science tells you about flyers, you yeah. start to see the, the, the story already in the first like two paragraphs begins to fall apart. Yeah. So um, first, how does the creature author know that the creature flew so far as we just said? Yeah. Right. Huge, huge red flag. So, and as I said, it's either a a, uh, purposeful embellishment or some kind of rationalization on the part of the author. Yeah. Um, We just simply don't know. And once again, why is the creature exhausted? Yeah. Right. Uh, if you look at albatross, mm-hmm. which are capable of flying extremely wide distances, like one of them flew the entire circumference of the of the planet. Yeah. In the span of like forty days. Mm-hmm. So they're extremely good at doing this. <laughs> um, yeah. 
like extremely good at doing this. And because of that, they're not using that much energy. Because think about that for a second, right? They're flying 40 continuous days. Yeah. Yeah, they're hunting, but the amount of energy that they're getting from hunting is not that great compared to how much energy, hypothetically, they're spending we'd uh, have to, while yeah. in flight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, it, assuming that they'd have to spend the same amount of energy as a human would to travel that distance. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. we know that they're adapted for long distances. Yeah. Right? In fact, I did some research. Uh-huh. Taking off and landing expends more energy for an albatross than, than flying around the world. Yeah. Yeah. So that that kind of makes the whole thing a little bit questionable. And not only yeah. that, but albatross are by bird species standards uh, yeah. among the largest with a wingspan of 11 feet roughly. Yeah, they're big boys, which, which is huge. That's huge for birds. Yeah. Um and not only that, but if this creature was a distance flyer and it was taking off and crash landing and taking off and crash landing, gotcha, da, 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 yeah, they'd be wasting way more energy. There's no way that it would have lasted several miles. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, though, it doesn't necessarily discredit the author mm-hmm. that they've made these this assumption because it could be that the author is anthropomorphizing the creature and applying its own understanding to it on its own. So we do have to continue reading, and we do have to continue trying to verify. But Mm -hmm. because of that, we need more more proof that this is a thing. Yeah. And we need to do more research and more thinking about how this is going to work out. Mm -hmm. So let's continue with the article. Ah, okay. They proceeded to make an examination and found it measured about 92 feet in length. Holy crap! Yeah. That's big! Yeah, so uh, to the American listeners out there, that's a third of a football field. Yeah. So that's a truly massive creature. Um, and then, then the, the article goes on to say something that I really don't understand at all. Yeah. Um. And the greatest d- diameter was about 50 inches. So maybe they're measuring around its body? Well, but that would be the circumference, right? I'm thinking I'm thinking they mean like the thickness. Yeah. It's just I've never seen the term diameter used in reference to like an animal. Yeah, that's like, a little bit weird. Like I maybe like a, a jellyfish I've seen that or an octopus or something like that, but a a bird, I've never really considered it, uh, you know, in the context of, you know, that. Yeah. Also, um, 50 inches is, that's... That's, that's half a hundred inches. That's it's what you got right there. half a hundred inches. That is half a hundred inches. Yeah. You are correct. Um, that's four feet. Yeah. It's a four foot uh, boy. Yeah, like that's big. That's a, that's a child in height. Yeah, that's just imagine that. So, uh, assuming a spherical thunderbird, no, a, a, a cylinder, <laughs> assume a cylindrical thunderbird or a sphere. You can have a circumference. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Imagine, if you will, okay, uh, a cross section of mm, four feet. That's probably like what a nine-year-old. Sure. I guess. Yeah, it's something like a nine-year-old. Yeah. Imagine, imagine like, say, four nine-year-olds standing shoulder to shoulder. Yeah. And there's about, mm, let's say, 150, mm-hmm. like, rows. That's about the yeah. size of this creature. I was thinking in giant jigglypuffs, but okay. That, that works, too. Well, it tells Clefairy. Uh, Clefairy's a nightmare creature. She's like, big, right? Bigger yeah. than you'd think. Let's see. Clefairy. Uh, well, Clefairy's smaller, and Clefable is a nightmare creature. Uh, um, yeah, that's it. Uh, Clefairy's two feet tall, which is still a lot. And, uh, yep, Clefable is four feet tall. Okay. So yeah. imagine, 
imagine uh what I say let's say five hundred Clefairy. Clefable. Yeah. Five hundred Clefable. Imagine five hundred yeah. Clefable. That's that, crazy. That's the Thunderbird. That's ridiculous. That's easier for me in a picture than nine year olds. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um The monster had only two feet, these being situated a short distance in front of where the wings joined the body. Okay. The head, as near as they could judge, was about eight feet long. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a big old head. Yeah. Um, and apparently the jaws were set thickly with strong, sharp teeth. Of its course eyes, they were. Its eyes were as large as a dinner plate and protruded about halfway from the head. It is, okay. That's a little bit weird, but okay. So, this is a massive creature. Yeah, they're describing something, like, really giant. Yeah, like, this is, this is like, a megafauna that I've never, ever even begun to dream of. Yeah. This person's creating um, it also kind of reminds me of uh, it kind of reminds me of the the, the pterodactyl from Pee Wee's Playhouse a little bit. Yeah, like because the that had like the bulging eyes and all uh-huh. that stuff. Um, but it's it once again because it seems as though this is my lot in life. It sounds like another pterosaur. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and for those of you who don't know, go back and listen to, what was it, episode 15, I think? The sure. Ropen. Oh, what are we, uh, I don't know. We're, we're on 20. 20. 8, 17, maybe 16? Yeah, actually it might be 16 because I, yeah. I do the even episodes. Uh, yeah, John Yells for an Hour is the name of the episode if you want to know. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I'm not going to go into to pterosaurs in extreme depth like I did. Because, you know, people listen to these episodes in a row, and I don't know if they want to hear me yelling about pterosaurs. Two episodes. People need to have fun. They had to have fun. Yeah. Um, so, I did some math. Okay. So, I took the estimate for what Quetzalcoatlus was, which is roughly, which is the largest uh, pterosaur that exists. Yeah. Um, and its description roughly matches, and I figured it'd be relatively close. So I did an initial back of the envelope as I'm writing this calculation, and it's probably using that. It's around uh, 1,320 pounds. Okay. So now let me tell you how I got that. Um, it's based on the Wikipedia weight of 440 pounds, which is the lower end weight of Quetzalcoatlus in modern estimation. Okay. Um, and that's for a 10 meter long individual. Yeah. This creature is about, you know, three times that size. Yeah. So I did a rough estimate of, you know, multiplying by three. Then yeah. I thought about it. So that's not a good estimate either. That's yeah. on the extreme low end for the weight of this creature, which is already about the weight of a small plane. Yeah. Like a Cessna. It's about half the weight of a Cessna. Mm-hmm. So... I remembered that there's this thing called the the uh, cube square law. Yeah. And uh, the way that works is a cube is once you scale a cube, the the ratio of the cube is not necessarily the ratio of the, it's it's not. So if you double the size of a cube, like on all of its axes. Yeah. The volume of that cube is not twice. No. Yeah. So no, if bigger. you have if you have a cube that's one by one by one, and then you scale it to, uh, I think it was, the example was like three by three by three. Yeah. Um, you have to multi- You have to take the square of the cross-sectional area and multiply it by the, the depth or something like that. Yeah. Which ultimately ends up being, um, so the way that works is, in the case of a cube that's one to three, you take... Uh, nine, which is the square of the cross-sectional dimensions. Yeah. And then multiply by the depth, which is three, because mm-hmm. that's the ratio, um, and you get 27 as okay. the, the volume. Yeah. Right? Which is, like, inches uh, cubed. Yep. So if we apply that math to the weight of this creature, 
it becomes almost 12,000 pounds. <laughs> uh, I'm looking it's this up right now. It's girthy. Yeah. Uh, it's so a in, big boy. Yeah. I want to. I want to point out an African bush element elephant, which I just pulled up the Wikipedia on this. Yeah. Um, because I was doing research on this before, and I realized what the how the calculation worked as I was out today. Yeah. Uh, an African bush element. I like the idea of an African bush elemental way better than an elephant. Uh, it weighs about 10.4 tons. Okay. Now, uh, that's about 22,000 pounds, 23,000 pounds. Yeah. So, using that knowledge, <laughs> this is half as heavy as an elephant. In a computer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the amount of lift it would require to stay aloft. Its wings would have been huge. Yeah. Huge. Uh, it, so keep in mind, it needs to generate about 12,000 pounds of lift with its wings. Yeah. And that's obscene for a oh, yeah. creature with musculature. Um, and on top of that, it needs more lift to take off than 12,000 pounds. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, what, that's once you're up there, it's 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 easier, but taking off, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to That's another gravity. story, yeah. So, um, but wait, as Mr. Popeil would say, there's more. Yeah, I like this. Yeah. So, they had some difficulty in measuring the wings. Oh, really? Did they? Yeah. Okay. Uh, they measured at 78 feet, making the total length from tip to tip 160 feet. Okay. The the wings were composed of a thick and nearly transparent membrane. Okay, those words usually don't go together, but continue. Yeah, I, well, no, no, I want to take a moment. That's bonkers. Yeah. So for okay. thick and transparent, that means that the flesh has to be close to clear. Which is not a good, um, what I would say, evolutionarily speaking, that's bad. Well, because... that, that might be pretty cool. <clears throat> well, no, but... it's terrible, though. Yeah? Because you're, if you have no melanin or anything to reflect the sun's rays, that creature probably has cancer. Yeah, but it probably like... scared everything, right? Imagine something with clear skin. You just see, like, skull and, like, blood and all that flowing through it and, like, a heart, like a beating heart. That'd be terrifying. I mean, it would be metal as all get up and yeah, go. Yeah, but... like super metal. But most of the time, creatures that live in an area that would be direct sunlight, like this would have to live, yeah. um, they need some kind of pigmentation to pr protect them from sunlight. Yeah. Generally speaking. Mm -hmm. Just as a rule. Um, anywho, they were also devoid of feathers or hair, right? Okay. So, kind of imagine the, we're going back to Ropen territory at this point. Oh, okay, um, take a deep breath. Yeah. The entire body also had no hair or feathers. Um, the skin of the body was comparatively easy, it was smooth and easily penetrated by a bullet. So, the way I read that is the wings were hard to puncture, but the skin was real super easy. Yeah. Which makes no sense. Um, so let me take a moment and just note that the largest wingspan of any discovered creature species, yes. which is, once again, Quetzalcoatlus, is about a fifth of this length <laughs> at 10 meters. <laughs> yeah. So... I also then started researching, and I was curious because I wanted to know, mm -hmm. uh, the wingspan of this creature is just a smidge smaller than a 747. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. it's still smaller than Rodan, but uh, it makes the Ropin look like a, a, like a finch at this yeah. point. Yeah. Um, I legitimately don't believe a creature that has these dimensions can live terrestrially. <laughs> like, oh no, there's probably a reason why we don't have <laughs> anything like that about. <laughs> but like, I legitimately don't think that it can 
physically exist. And then once again, this is this is using the the old model of the pterosaur. Yeah. Um, which I did do research and look into. Pterosaurs were known, and they were using the bat wing model for the pterosaur, yeah. where the 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 phalanges were a yeah. part of the um uh the wings for the pterosaur, which has mm-hmm. been through empirical evidence and fossil record has been shown to be a false model. So we don't use that. Um, gotcha. But yeah, so it's once again kind of sounds suspicious. Yeah. However, yes, the unnamed men did take a sample. Ooh, okay. So the men caught off, cut off a small portion of the tip of one wing and took it home with them. Okay. Late last night, which would have been, uh, because keeping in mind this was on a Saturday, so it would have been a Friday night. Okay. Uh, one of them arrived in this city, which was Tombstone, because mm-hmm. it's been a while since we mentioned the name of the city, um, for supplies and to make the necessary preparations to skin the creature. Okay. When the, hi- when the hide will be sent east for examination by eminent scientists of the day. Uh-huh. The finder... Uh, returned early this morning, accompanied by several prominent men, yeah. also unnamed, uh, <laughs> who will endeavor to bring the strange creature to the city before it is mutilated. Too important to be named, uh, mm-hmm. those men were. You, They're you, prominent, though. Yeah. They're prominent. They're prominent. Um, so, this is big, because if the creature was in fact butchered, if there was a skin sample, which... You know, having just a sin sample doesn't necessarily mean anything because, you know, if you don't have anything to compare it to or you don't have any of the surrounding information and if you do tanning and all that kind of stuff, it will affect the the nature of it. Yeah. Right. And the things we can learn from it. Uh-huh. Um, but because this is 1890, there might have been a photo of this corpse. Oh, yeah. Because it's 1890. But first... We need to we need to go into a little bit of tombstone. Yeah. Uh huh. Today's episode is brought to you by Dirty Urns Waste Management. Dirty Urns specializes in the discreet pickup and disposal of all residential waste. Never worry about your neighbors waking up to an unexpected pickup again. Our private and discreet service will accept any refuse, no questions asked. Earn and his tight-lipped employees will provide a disposal bin smaller than an average sedan. It is bear-proof, which means it is lockable and will not allow any unwanted stench to escape. Provide a pickup location on the purchase order and they will get your waste from any location, whether it be behind the house as not to annoy the neighbors, or any other discreet location and haul it away like it never happened. Now back to the show. Let's samurai, guy. Let's pump up the power. Let's kick some gigabun. Surf's <laughs> up. Wait, what? What are you saying? Ah, uh, just some stuff. The the eldritch summoning ritual to be cyberized. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Oh, that actually reminds me. Talking about yeah. eldritch things, I found a. Uh, a manga well after after i finished uh the promised neverland yeah i found a manga called emperor and i yeah it's about a girl who finds an emperor penguin in her refrigerator and she adopts it as her pet yeah that's it (laughs) um it's a phenomenal thing this has entered the room it is torturing jiro (laughs) <laughs> who's that's appropriate buff- that's yeah, totally the right thing to do he's totally befuddled by my uh my my sound baffle that i have set up yeah so anywho we should probably get back to this because we've already spent at least 30 minutes talking about uh pop culture this episode. yeah so before we get into what happened to uh-huh. the tombstone thunderbird yeah we need to go into what is going on in Tombstone in 19, 1890, mm-hmm. right? So, Tombstone was a silver mining town in the Old West. Mm-hmm. It had incorporated in 1881, but at the time of the article, it had fallen into hard times. Okay. According to True West Magazine, which I believe because if you're writing a magazine about the West, 
and anything bad happens in it, uh, it probably actually happened uh-huh. because people like to romanticize the Wild West. The Wiki so, Wild West. The Wiki Wiki Wild. Um, so after the infamous uh, gunfight at the OK Corral, which happened the year that the town incorporated. Yeah. <laughs> a uh, An earthquake hit the town and it flooded the silver mines. Uh-huh. Um, which they attempt to drain and it failed because a fire <laughs> broke out in the in the pump house. <laughs> That's unfortunate. And it, it literally reached a point where it was too expensive to try to pump it anymore, so they stopped. Oh man. Um so this article was written from the perspective of a town in decline. Yeah. At the end of the day. However, in the tradition of the old west. Uh, they had several bars. Of course, of course they did. Proper, Why would they? Yeah, which is the proper proper response. Well, because you know you get in a gun you get in a gunfight at one bar, and you get in a gunfight at another bar, and you get in the gunfight at the third bar. You still got the fourth bar to be you know to visit. Yeah. Um. They also, and this is the weirdest part to me, they mm-hmm. had two competing newspapers. That's kind of weird. Yeah, they had the Nugget. Yeah. And the Epitaph. Which okay. is the, the one that the story was printed in. Uh-huh. Um, so clearly the Nugget had another article that's the same but competing, so it's better. Because that's how they work, right? So it was only run in the Epitaph. That's weird. You'd think they would have both picked up on such a large event. Yeah, there was also no outreach from the Chamber of Commerce, local government, anything. Oh. In fact, uh, there was never a follow-up article either. <laughs> yeah okay so, there's a i'd say a flag of a dark um perhaps reddish color yeah so i'm gonna i'm gonna you know uh i'm gonna quote someone because this is pretty much the best way of putting it uh yeah. it's from a weird arizona article by troy taylor okay um the tombstone thunderbird gave all the appearances of the tall tales that were often written in the Western newspaper of the era. Because okay. that's exactly what it smells like. Yeah. <laughs> it's it a great like story. There's, there's a little too much rye whiskey going around. Yeah. But you know what the weird part is? Yeah. The story doesn't end. What do you mean it doesn't end? They found a big old bird, they measured it, and apparently there's no follow-up. That's not the ending of the story, though. And okay. It's kind of insane what happens next. So, <laughs> uh, uh-huh. uh, half a century later in 1930, a story the story gets reprinted by Horace Bell in his his book on the Old West Coast. Unfortunately, since it's 1930, not in the public domain, I can't find it. Right? <laughs> because uh-huh. that's what happens to these books. Same thing happened with the between two papas, all that stuff. It's just a problem. Yeah. Mickey Mouse, you're a monster. Yeah, blame Mickey. Oh. You've made my life. You've made my life so much harder. So much harder. Mm-hmm. Um, it should be noted that in this book, I found nobody mentioning any mention of a photograph or a follow up to this article. Okay. Which is key, and also the uh, the epitaph has gone back back through their records. Yeah. And haven't found a, a follow up either. Oh, okay. Well, at least they did go back and look. Yeah. I mean, that's that's actually good. Yeah. yeah. So, once again, silence for 33 years. <laughs> 1963, I don't know what it is, but talk yeah. about this particular cryptid literally explodes. Oh, right on. Yeah. So, um, in Saga Magazine, a story. the story just resurfaces through the lens of Jack Pearl. And he, he adds a new embellishment to it. And, uh-huh. you know, here it is. So the Tombstone Epitaph published a photograph in 1886 of a huge bird nailed to a wall. Uh-huh. The newspaper said that it had been shot by two prospectors and hauled into town by a wagon. Lined up in front of the bird were six grown men with their arms outstretched fingertip to fingertip. The creature measured about 36 feet from wingtip to wingtip. Okay. So, uh, 
this is a really strange turn for this story because it's a 73 year old story at this point yeah why was it not mentioned in the publication in on the old west coast because mm-hmm. even though it's not 190 feet 36 feet is still a massive non-existent no type specimens exist bird yeah that's that's literally a pterodactyl yeah no or, or quetzalcoatlus it's huge yeah. right why did knowledge of this this photograph disappear for 73 years because it's not like we didn't have print we literally yeah. have a photocopy of the original article mm-hmm. why wasn't tombstone saved from nearly becoming a ghost town in 1923 by this bird <laughs> yeah for the resurgence, I could say maybe because that's from 63 to what was it? It was 1930 to 19. So 33 years later. So that yeah. could be maybe even like partially attributed to um, like that's something someone would have heard when they were younger, like pretty young. Yeah. And then, th- you know, 33 years later, they're at the age when they're like, writing for a newspaper and maybe talking with some friends of a similar age and they bring back the same way we mentioned stuff from our childhood and be like, Oh yeah, the, uh, the, you know, this or that or the other thing. And we go, Oh, you know, that was so cool. That could have been someone when, Oh shit. I remember this thing about the bird. It'll be pretty cool. And then they just publish it sort of like a 1963 nostalgia throwback to 1930. I recognize what you're saying, but at the same yeah. time, I do feel like it would have been printed in the on old on the old West Coast book. Oh, it would that, have been. That's that's yeah. the kind of stuff that 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 sells books. Yeah. Right. Um. And I really feel like it's important to hammer home. Why wasn't this issue of the the epitaph found? But the first edition, which carried the original story, really yeah. easy to find. Like, literally, I googled Tombstone Thunderbird and found it in seconds. <laughs> yeah? So, okay. why? And then, to make matters even worse, uh-huh. another writer, H.M. Kramer, wrote that the story was true and the photos had been published in newspapers across the country. Oh, so you should have been able to find something. I should have been able yeah. to find something. Yeah. I mean, well, I did find something, but we're going to talk about that in a second. Okay. So, uh, the editors of Fate, which was the magazine that he had published in, also yeah. even believed that they had published the photo in the the past. <laughs> but uh-huh. they looked through their archived issues and found nothing. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Continuing in this trend, a Fortean Times researcher, Ivan T. Sanderson, even claimed to have a photocopy of the photo. But it was lost when he lent it to two associates. Come on! So, <laughs> this story is just like, what the hell? Yeah, what's got Everybody seems to be losing everything in a very convenient way. It's it's a lot of convenient loss. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. So, to this day, Jack Pearl's claim remains unverified. However, tons of people claim to have seen this photo. Oh, okay. It, myself included. Uh huh. There's a part of me that remembers have having seen it. Yeah. Right. But it's likely to be one of the many fake photos of the Tombstone Thunderbird. And for uh, Patreon subscribers, I've got a few pages, and we're gonna we're gonna talk. Brandon and I are gonna riff on the some of these pictures for a second. Yeah, I mean, there's... I don't know what you mean by fake, because there's clearly so, no way. The first photo, um, it's not necessarily the Tombstone Thunderbird, but I think I saw an article claiming that it was. The Civil War is, one. Yeah, the Civil War one. Yeah, It's a bunch of uh, soldiers in the Civil War uniforms. Uh, I think that's the... Is that the South or the North? I am, I'm really bad, because... <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to say north because of the color of their shirts, but the south because of the color of their pants. Uh, yeah, I think it's the south because the south wore a blue uh, uniform. Yeah. Um, so some southern soldiers are 
<sighs> they've downed a thunder uh, a, a pterosaur. Um, now there's a few problems. A few problems. Um, one, uh, the effect on the photo is clearly yeah. a Photoshop filter. No, come like, on. I literally think I could open up Photoshop and make this picture's filter instantaneously. Uh-huh. Um, second, uh huh. the pterosaur is literally, like, clearly fake. No, it's not. <laughs> it looks like it was painted. That's so real. Um, so, and also, more importantly, it doesn't match the description that Jack Pearl had of a giant bird um pinned to a uh pinned to a whatchamacallit uh farmhouse and six men had their arms outstretched yeah there's six yeah. men in it but their arms literally aren't outstretched to uh -huh. show the, the length of the bird so I, I did a quick uh bit of click -a and found that this specific photo was a publicity shot for the 2000 television series freaky links and they were um okay they were civil war reenactors and it was a prop aerodactyl that was used in the show uh um, okay yeah so lauren coleman by the way did say that it was lauren coleman tracked it down and found the actual found the prop okay yeah well because uh uh basically the problem is some people are claiming that this is fact so you want to know um, the names of one of those people? Of course it's John Whitcomb. <laughs> We're going to move on from this photo because now this is tainted. Yeah. I'm not even going to touch this anymore. No? Okay, so uh, the next photo uh, is, once again, not a modern understanding of how a pterosaur works. Yeah. Um, also, the individuals are not have they don't have their hands outstretched. And um, they also don't have it pinned to a wall. So definitely not fake. Um, no, it's totally real. The The third one, uh, it's it's hung to a wall. So they're already the doing third better. One the most. It's like way, at least way better than the first two. Yeah. At, at the very least, it looks like it's a practical prop. And yeah, like it kind of looks legitimate. Um, they also all look like they're from the pacific northwest not from arizona <laughs> i was gonna say man i don't know if there's wisconsin had any of these animals <laughs> yeah they look like they're straight out of wisconsin and there's eight people there not yeah. six so it's a good looking prop whatever that is I yeah mean, i it, like it i think it's a cool picture cool yeah i i'm Someone's definitely got that in their living room or their basement to show off yeah no that definitely seems like it oh and then the next one that would actually, like, at first blush, that was like, oh, hmm, this might be plausible. Uh-huh. But, uh, nope, no, nope, no, they just they just photoshopped out a dead dude, moved the dude around, and uh, made a fake pterosaur for the front of it. Oh. Yeah. So, um, there's also another picture of the pterosaur where it's like, if you, uh, not pterosaur. A picture, a picture of the Thunderbird. Mm -hmm. If you Google Thunderbird and Thunderbird bird, because if you Google Thunderbird, Mozilla Thunderbird comes up first. Um, there's a picture of a very large, like almost crow-looking thing. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of the thing that I always envision anytime I think of Thunderbird, and it looks like it's in some kind of museum. Uh -huh. Um, I don't I, see. Here's the problem. I okay. It lived 61, 6 million years ago and had a wingspan of around 30 feet. Its feathers were as long as samurai swords, according to this oh, internet Oh, that thing. sounds cool. Yeah. Um, but every time I think of the Thunderbird, I think of this picture, which I'm adding to the show notes. Okay. Um, that's the picture I think of. So, here's the thing, though. This is a story <laughs> about the mutability of memory. That's a real picture. Yeah, it's no, that is actually a real picture. That's also a picture of something that's very different than what we're talking about. It's a big old crow. Yeah, or a raven. Like big, big yeah, crow I don't know. Raven. I still don't know if bird thing. 
the real problem with that picture is I don't know anything about the context of that picture. Yeah. And it also wasn't related to the, the this iteration of the Thunderbird. Yeah. So I didn't put any more effort into it. Okay. That's that's all I'm gonna say. So I have no idea about the authenticity authenticity of this picture this black and white picture of a man smiling in front of a giant bird. Uh huh. Uh that's clearly dead, but or a prop. I have no idea what it is because literally I have no context, so literally I can't say one way or the other. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, the thrust of the story and one of the reasons I wanted to cover it, um, well, the main reason I wanted to cover it is because I remember this story from when I was young. Yeah, I think um, that po- photo you just posted is in a, a museum yeah. somewhere because on the left side it looks like there's a skeleton, the tail end of a skeleton of some sort, and on yeah. the other side of that uh, bird looking thing there's clearly at least three people on the left wing holding it up oh yeah 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 you can see see their legs yeah yeah so but let me uh, getting back to the rap so to speak um human memory is mutable right yeah i remember seeing this photo i know i didn't see it yeah you know this morning, I remember doing X, Y, or Z. I didn't do it. Yeah, I you know? remember Shazam uh, differently. Yeah, exactly. We remember things differently because our mind changes things. It mutates things. It causes us to doubt what we've seen or become confident in what we've seen. Yeah. Right? And we have to remember that. And anytime we look into a story like this, we have to remember that. Like, how many... like. For example, the Berenstein versus Berenstain Bears. Uh-huh. That's that's a thing that trips people up all the time. There's people who believe Nelson Mandela died in prison, and there's people who believe that certain individuals are competent, despite all evidence pointing to the contrary. <laughs> um, uh-huh. But at the end of the day, like, what I'm talking about is the Mandela effect, and that actually might be an interesting episode in its own right. Um, yeah. But... I kind of already have the conclusion and that's the human brain was designed to uh, survive in the wild. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of weird stuff that it does. And there's a lot of uh, not designed, but it it developed to survive in the wild rather. Yeah. Um, And there's a lot of things that we do that are based in that, that are Mm -hmm. rooted in that. Our fear of snakes, like, it's a very common thing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Our fear of the dark, the unknown, those are things that make sense because when we were hunter-gatherers, those fears made sense. Yeah. Right? It wasn't necessary that we remember every, strictly every detail of something. It was only that necessary that we remember the vaguest notions. Because at the end of the day, we didn't have advanced mapping technology. We didn't need that because it wasn't necessary for us to have it, Mm -hmm. right? And it wasn't necessary for our survival for that to be a thing. In fact, it might even be advantageous to us that we don't have perfect recall. Because if we had perfect recall and we always remembered something being perfect somewhere or something or something along those lines, you know, we might in our wanderings go through the same place too much or stayed stationary too long yeah right uh because of those facts or we might remember something more fondly than it actually was because it will encourage us to go to hunting grounds that worked Mm -hmm. so there's a bunch of things that our brain has done to help us survive and if we remembered everything perfectly, I don't know if that would help us survive. So I don't know if there's an evolutionary advantage to having perfect recall. So I know I just went on a tangent. And <laughs> literally, literally what I wrote about this was three sentences long. But this is something I think about a lot, you know, because it, it's something that affects us. It's a uniquely mm-hmm. human trait to uh, – wonder and try and like change and put rose colored glasses on things right yeah um but i think part of that is we're protecting ourselves Mm -hmm. and i think that a reality in which this thunderbird existed is is more interesting 
right? A reality in which that picture exists is more interesting. And hey, you know what? If it gets discovered tomorrow and it's credible, that might be interesting. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't prove that that creature existed. And that being said, the creature that existed wouldn't prove the first story because it's a totally different creature. (laughs) Which is the weirdest thing about this whole story is that these two things have become linked. Uh But the story's still not done. (laughs) Um... There's actually a coda to the story in 1970. Okay. Uh Uh-huh. Harry McClure claimed to have known the two men who were mentioned in the original story. Oh, of course he did. Which I should also note, still unnamed. Um, (laughs) That's that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. I don't know how to bullshit that, but you could. Yeah, uh, according to his account, they shot at a bird with a wingspan of 20 to 30 feet, which is more in line with the second story, which, you know... Said it was, what, 36? 36. Yeah. Um, It's an odd and slightly more believable postscript to this this tale. Yeah. Slightly, because that's still the size of a Quetzalcoatlus. Yeah. So, um, at the end of the day, it can't be verified at all. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think it was Ben Kissel wearing angel wings, but that's just me. I think every cryptid is Ben Kissel, to yeah. be totally honest. No, that's fair. Because that's a better reality for me. Yeah. So I'm I'm replacing every image of a cryptid with mm-hmm. Ben Kissel. So um, the Dover Demon gets real weird, but, you know. <laughs> Flatwoods yeah. is strange now. Bigfoot's unchanged. Yeah. Um, Red caps are terrifying. Red caps are more terrifying. Yeah. Mongolian deathworm hasn't changed. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. It's Although weird. also Orang Pendek hasn't changed either. Um <laughs> because I'm still convinced that that's just Danny DeVito. It so. probably just is Danny DeVito. I, I I see no evidence any other way. Yeah. Um So, uh I guess that's all I got for this episode. Um I will be coming back with more Thunderbird stuff in the future. Nice. Podcast, I can't wait. Sure. Uh, I've already started looking into some stuff in terms of the Native American lore. And let me tell you, uh, there is no, literally no chance that the modern Thunderbird we talk about today is the Native uh-huh. American Thunderbird. Oh, because the Native okay. American Thunderbird may or may not be a god incarnate. But we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into yeah. that. Um, so as always, our website is cryptopediacast.com. Uh, on Instagram, you can reach us at cryptopediacast, and on Twitter, it's at cryptopediacast as well. Um, the email is cryptopediacast at gmail.com or us at cryptopediacast. Um, keep in mind, we, uh, we do do these episodes in advance, so if anyone's posted anything or asked any questions, uh or anything like that we'll you get might back not to you. hear them for up to three weeks <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> yeah. legitimately a thing because yeah let's see we're recording this it's going to be three weeks before this episode hits your ears yeah from when we recorded it um w- which we do that so we have more time to produce so brandon has more time to produce i we both have more time to research and yeah. we are able to relax and enjoy the podcast and not be on a slow death march towards our demise well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> we do need more time, but it's still uh, it's time consuming, man. It is time consuming. I did put like at least I'd say five or six hours into this this episode yeah. alone. I bet we each lose about a work week worth of uh, you know afternoons. We were yeah we were we lose at least a work a work day. You mean there. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. I, I I think I think that's fair. Uh per episode, it's at least a work week. Yeah. A work day. A work day. Yeah. So but we do it because we we like the content, we we talk and we like entertaining, I guess. Yeah. I, don't know. I think I do more than a work day. well, I work overtime. If you work overtime it's probably probably work day there's a it's work man no it is which hey that's for we just gotta research pay. that's outside of like 
that's outside of like editing and outside of like monitoring and uploading and 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 yeah. and all the social and all the other yeah, ancillary yeah. stuff like there's a whole yeah. bunch of like just which i gotta research. say i'm yeah. still impressed at the speed at which you can you can produce these episodes i've been kicking them out faster yeah i can't i can't produce so here's the let's part let's uh let's part the curtain a little bit brandon is our main producer which i mentioned on every episode uh and i handle more of the internet like our our web presence and like maintaining our website and maintaining our yeah our handles well, and all that stuff like across all platforms and then yeah. you go and you change like the 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 sources like across the board make them easy to use yeah for links and go so, everything online and all it, that yeah it's one of those things we tried we balance the workloads to our personal experience divide and um, conquer yeah so but i still i could never do the production work i just am not i'm not built for that it took me it took me so long to edit the episode for um uh creepypedia like yeah. not even joking it took me like an hour to do 16 minutes <laughs> <laughs> and so, i can't remember how long it took me to do the first to do the red caps episode probably took me like four times the length to do our current episodes and it was only 30 minutes yeah yeah but um we do have a patreon if you want to oh, support yeah. us in our endeavors because oh, it yeah. is it is kind of like a job um and you know we got three tiers on there we got the the one dollar two dollar and five dollar tier Hoops, one dollar snakes jackalopes hoed eggs yep and uh the order's a little bit off but yeah yeah something like that so, but uh, if you go on the crypt on um, the website, you get some bonus content with some of those tiers. Uh, One dollar is nothing; it's more or less just the uh, hey, thanks. And you can actually donate as much as you want. It's just you don't get any of the content. So I would honestly recommend just if you're gonna donate more than five dollars, go hodag so you get the content. Yeah. Um. The the second tier gets access to the show notes, and the third tier gets access to our premium. Oh yeah, um, that's additional. We've got for the Jackalopes. There's like additional different podcasts that we each do. Yeah. Um, it's better. You get additional audio content. Two dollars. Yeah. You get our uh, our write ups, which are what what do we got here. We've got uh, twelve pages. We've got links to all the sources. There's photographs for each one. Uh, we also make fun of each other in them sometimes. We make fun of each other. Yeah. yeah. There's there's some there's some hidden jokes in there for the sake of the the reader, yeah. Uh, because we have fun with that. Also, I do um, uh, footnotes and citations for all for a bunch of stuff, and Brandon does sources and all that stuff too. And we we put a lot of work into these sources. So oh yeah, um, I think for uh, Skinwalkers Part Two next week, there's gonna be some sources at the bottom if people want to watch some uh, links to like documentaries and stuff like that. That they yeah. uh, they can find. I think I also linked to for anytime I said Destination Truth, there's a free version of it online. So like all, all that stuff that we reference is, yeah. is you can go watch it. It's fun. Yeah. yeah, and I think I think I'm probably gonna there's probably I got a few ideas for some podcasts. Yeah, uh, they're basically oh, no. It's basically just I, I think I'm gonna be doing pilots for podcasts <laughs> on the. Uh, <laughs> I like Patreon that idea, man. And just yeah. see what people like, and then whatever people like will be the ones that I do. Because I got, <laughs> I got like ideas for like ten of them, but I don't want to take up like a public feed with them. <laughs> so uh -huh. we'll see. the The future will be interesting for uh, for our Patreon's uh, podcast feed. Nice. Also, if we ever decide to get ads, which I don't really know if we're gonna ever get ads on this show, to be totally honest, because I've I've been doing the math and really doesn't pay off like there's not a lot you have to yeah. you have to reach like a crazy high level for ads to even matter and they take away from the, the thrust of the show so yeah although i will say no i'm not above it <laughs> oh, let me tell you if a podcast network came to us tomorrow and said hey do you want to join our network and read ads i'd probably say yeah yeah like not gonna not gonna lie just yeah. like We'd still keep the Patreon and all that stuff, but 
and we'd probably make an ad free version on the Patreon, but I would I would do it in a heartbeat. Oh yeah. Um I will say with that said, we're you know, we'll never shill or change the content for anyone. And I would also like to say that uh today's episode was brought to you by Chef Boy R D. Chef Boy R D is my preferred instant soup. Uh I was actually gonna talk about TripAdvisor, but you know, you beat me too. They it. are also very good trip advisor. Every time I go on a trip, I use TripAdvisor. Every oh, yeah. single time. I find them so useful. They're very good for finding uh, pizza places yes. that have golden arches. Really? Yeah. That's really good. Like um, It's also super specific. Like McDonald's or like uh, Little Caesars. Little Caesars, home of the hot and ready. All right. Well, I there's also where we were in the ad read. <laughs> there's also a Facebook group. <laughs> uh, we're starting to get some activity on that. Um, we announce things that are happening during, we, we kind of live tweet yeah. <laughs> the podcast because Brandon, when my, uh, monitor broke, Brandon posted about my monitor breaking last week. Yeah. So that was a thing. Um, uh-huh. if you enjoyed us talking about things for 30 minutes that we really shouldn't have talked about, <laughs> you can always rate, review, subscribe, comment. Share with your friends, all that good stuff. I know you've heard it a million times if you're listening to our podcast, but word of mouth does matter. Yeah. <laughs> um, once again, this was a requested episode, so if you have any requests, feel free to send them in. Um, if you have any creepy pasta or cryptopasta, pasta, that's one of the podcasts that I do for premium content. <laughs> I also have a relationship advice show oh for the gosh, patrons. All the dookies. All the dookie. There's I can't like a wait solid, for that to come out. There's like a solid six minutes of you just laughing on that I one. couldn't finish the sentence. It was oh, bad. It was a bad one, though. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, man. Uh, if you'd like, you could follow me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at crypto brandon, capital C, capital B. <sighs> oh, man, the yawns are coming back. Oh, man. It's every time there's a, it's every time there's every single time. Um, <laughs> It's it's almost nine o'clock. I'm tired. This is John's bedtime. Um, <laughs> on Instagram, we're at mute. I'm at. <laughs> I'm becoming a hive mind. Don't worry about it. It's okay. <laughs> um, I'm at mu twenty fifty seven. The website is defunct. My Twitter is at jf dunham. You'll probably get some hot takes on Transformers. I don't know. <laughs> If you want to email me, email me at john at cryptopediacast.com. I just want to go to sleep. <laughs> Our art is done by Tom Hill. You can find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com and his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. And as always, I'm... <laughs> I'm exhausted, John. As always... We are John. <laughs> we are John. We are here. We are Legion. Uh, oh, I'm all that Brandon. good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm cutting Brandon off. No, it's all good. And uh, I'm <laughs> I'm Brandon. <laughs> and things are already really weird. <laughs> know um in beast wars there's this notion of protoforms mm-hmm. you know, and transformers in general there's the notion of protoforms and um what happened was uh the maximals were piloting a research class ship known as the axelon uh-huh. um and as they're traveling they encountered david k's megatron which mm-hmm. is the uh beast megatron yeah um who had recently stolen the golden discs from the records of iacon mm-hmm and because he had stolen the discs from Icon, yeah. uh, he was basically on alert. So the Maximals decided to pursue because someone had to pursue him because mm-hmm. he had stolen yeah. the golden discs. 
um, which contained the Covenant of Primus and some other stuff, but, you know, that's a whole other thing. Anywho, so uh, the Maximals, because they were a research ship, uh, there was a crew that was currently, their sparks were uh, implanted and they had forms, uh-huh. but they also had a bunch of protoforms on ship to help with the research once they found their destination. Yeah. Um, but because the Axelon had fallen, had been shot by the Nemesis, which is the name of Megatron ship, uh, they were shot into space. Mm-hmm. Now, keep in mind, this is just the setup. Yeah. This isn't the episode. Um, each episode, for a couple episodes, basically what would happen is a protoform would fall to, to Earth. The Beast Wars would have to fight. There would be Beast Wars over who gets the they, protoform. They'd fight over the protoform, yeah. and then it, it like the first thing it scanned is the, the thing it would turn it. It's a really cool idea, by the way, the, yeah. how that whole situation works out. But the, the long and short of it is Transmutate's pod got damaged, and it was in a high energon area, mm-hmm. which resulted in it becoming deformed and unable to transform or survive on the planet yeah. um, because of the fact that the planet was so rich in energon. Mm-hmm. Um, Rampage and Silverbolt uh, became attached to it because it represented something about both of them. Yeah. Like, uh, Silverbolt's a fusor, so mm-hmm. he's a little bit different. And Rampage has a immortal spark, so they both see a kindred spirit and, and transmutate, which ultimately results in transmutate's death. 